Dit is Papa Alpha 0 Echo Tango Echo. Optimisme is een verantwoordelijkheid. Als er een natuurramp gebeurt, vertrouw jij dan je leven toe aan het feit dat mobiele telefoons en internetverbindingen nog werken? Vertrouw je daar het leven van je gezinsleden aan toe? Ik dacht het niet. Amateurradio. Communicatie die altijd blijft werken. Und auch heute ist der Deutschlandrundspruch des DHRC wieder mit im Programm von Papa Alpha 00 News. Wir freuen uns, dass wir in den Niederlanden landesweit auf 145,575 MHz auf dem Relais Papa India 3 Uniform Tango Romeo ausgestrahlt werden und grüßen alle Hörer in Papa Alpha und in den niederländischen Überseegebieten in der Karibik, die uns auf PI3 UTR via Echolink zuhören. Wir wünschen euch einen guten Empfang und schicken herzliche 73 aus Deutschland Und aan alle meisjes, 88. De nu volgende uitzending bevat schokkende voorbeelden van hoe een hobby mensenlevens kan veranderen. Bij jonge mensen onder de 18 kan de aanwezigheid van een volwassene tijdens de uitzending gewenst zijn. Massive and expensive equipment marks the professional radio station. But in the amateur field, radio parts often include pieces of assorted junk ingeniously assembled by operators who are called hams and who take up broadcasting as a hobby. The following program contains strong language throughout. Ik heb laatst een dipmeter gekocht. Wat is dat, een dipmeter? Dat weet ik ook niet, maar er zei iemand op de repeater dat die apparaten heel erg handig waren, en dat je er vroeger zelfs niet zonder kon. Een dipmeter. Wat zou dat kunnen zijn? Ja, als het nou een dipsausmeter geweest zou zijn, dan had ik het wel geweten. Het gaat er natuurlijk niet alleen om wat die meter is, maar ook wat je ermee kunt doen. Ik weet wel wat een meter is, maar wat is nou een dip? Ik bedoel, elektronisch gesproken dan... Ik weet het trouwens al. Het is om te testen of je dipswitches goed staan. Woon jij al lang in de Havermoutstraat? Hoe kom je erbij? Ik woon niet in de Havermoutstraat. Ik woon op het Cornflakespad. Oké. Okay. En waar woon jij dan? Ja, in de Milkshake buurt. Op het banaan met ananaspad. Nog problemen met plaatsen van antennes daar? Helemaal niet. Ik heb de antenne mastwit met een rode spiraalbies geschilderd. En er zit bovenaan een knik in. Tegen de buren heb ik gezegd dat het een rietje is. Ik heb vandaag een nieuwe antenne tuner gekocht. Oh ja, wat ga je daar dan mee doen? Ja, dat weet ik nog niet. Ik heb begrepen dat je er de golven mee kunt laten staan. Staat dat beter dan als die golven staan? Ik zou eerder zeggen als ze toch slapen, laat ze dan maar liggen. Dat weet ik eigenlijk niet of golven wel kunnen liggen. Ze kunnen echter wel staan. Zitten doen ze ook niet? Nee, zitten doen ze ook dus niet. Als ik binnenkort mijn F haal, dan ga ik op de lage korte golfbanden een lang draadantenne gebruiken. Hoe lang is dat eigenlijk zo'n lang draadantenne? Ja, dat weet ik niet. In elk geval is hij lang. Ik hang hem op als een sloper. Dan zou ik maar goed oppassen dat je andere antennes heel blijven. Bij een sloper weet je dat natuurlijk nooit. Voor ontvangst zit ik een beverage antenne te overwegen. Zou je dat wel doen? Beverage betekent frisdrank. Een frisdrankantenne, dat klinkt niet heel serieus. Ze zijn heel goed hoor, vooral bij de zwakke signalen. Ja, dat zal wel. Heb je zin in koffie? Ja, lekker. Oké, ga jij maar even zetten dan. As an expert in the field, I want to expressly advise everyone to not listen to PA00 News on Friday evening. Goedenavond, dit is de lange uitzending van de Daily Minutes, ook bekend als PNL Del News. We beginnen vanavond met de vijf Nederlandstalige Daily Minutes uitzendingen van afgelopen week. En aan het eind van de uitzending is er zoals altijd de Duitsland toen sproeg. Ken jij misschien PA5ROB? Bedoel je die gast uit Zaandam? Ja. Die vaak op de camping staat daar bij Apeldoorn. Jazeker. Die altijd op de camping s'avonds laat met de kat gaat wandelen? Inderdaad. Nee, die ken ik niet. Boeien no semmon katoshite. Watashi wa kinyoobi no yoru ni PA00 news ni mimi o katamuke nai yo ni dare mo jogen suru. 
Dit is Papa Alpha 0 Eco Tingo Eco voor de Daily Minutes met een nieuwsupdate voor vandaag 13 juni 2016 is het bulletin van maandag. Vandaag uiteraard een moesten worden en verder een iets groter SSTV plaatje in PD90. Je kunt de SSTV plaatjes in deze uitzending ontvangen door simpelweg je smartphone voor de luidspreker te houden. Voor Android heb je daarvoor de app genaamd Robot36 nodig en voor iOS de app CQ SSTV. Beide zijn uit de respectievelijke Play en App Stores te downloaden. Op de PC is MMSSTV de beste optie. Dat draait zowel onder Windows als met behulp van Wine onder Linux. Verder is er QSSTV speciaal voor Linux. Dat je op Debian systemen, op Debian systemen dus, als Ubuntu en Mint kunt installeren met het commando sudo apt-get install QSSTV. Ik zag vanochtend toevallig dat RTL 7 de serie Last Man Standing aan het uitzenden is. Dat is een sitcom rond hoofdpersoon Tim Baxter die in de serie Radiomateur is. Last Man Standing wordt in de VS op ABC, een van de grote netwerken nationwide uitgezonden op prime time. Goede Nederlandse woorden daarvoor heb ik niet. Acteur van de hoofdpersoon is Tim Allen, die was eerder bekend van de serie Home Improvement. Allen speelt in de serie marketing directeur van een winkelketen in sportartikelen. Hij is conservatief en nogal van de traditionele waarden, wat hem het leven als vader van drie dochters niet gemakkelijk maakt. De serie heeft door de jaren heen diverse cameo's gekend van allerlei celebs. De bekendste daarvan in Nederland zijn ongetwijfeld Kim Kardashian en Jay Leno. De laatste speelde zelfs drie keer in de serie mee. Vanochtend zag ik een aflevering waar niet heel veel zendamateurisme in zat. Naarmate de serie voordat krijgt om zijn hobby een steeds grotere rol. Met name ook doordat de dochter van Mike in de serie ook interesse in de hobby ontwikkelt. Dochter Eve is Baxter's favoriet. Maar het is de oudere dochter Mandy die in de serie het zendamateurisme ontdekt als een alternatief voor chatten. Wanneer haar het gebruik van haar smartphone verboden wordt. De serie wordt momenteel overdag twee keer per dag op RTL 7 uitgezonden. Eén keer om half één smiddags. De aflevering wordt de dag erop om tien uur dertig herhaald. Tegelijk dus met de herhaling van de Daily Minutes. Op RTL loopt op dit moment het tweede seizoen. In de VS is het vijfde seizoen inmiddels uitgezonden. En zijn contracten getekend voor een zesde seizoen. In het SSTV plaatje van vandaag een scène uit Last Man Standing. Met dochter Mandy in de check achter de amateurmicrofoon. In de VS is Limor Fried, Alpha Charlie 2, Sierra November geëerd als kampioenen van de technische vernieuwing door het Witte Huis. In een verklaring maakt het Witte Huis bekend tijdens haar studie aan de Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, besloot Limor om een bedrijf op te zetten dat zich richt op het maken van elektronica voor makers van alle leeftijden en voor zowel mensen met veel ervaring op dit gebied als mensen zonder ervaring. Limor Fried is beter bekend onder haar bijnaam Lady Ada. Aan elkaar vastgeschreven, de oprichter van het innovatieve bedrijf Ada Fruit. Fried was de eerste vrouwelijke ingenieur die op de koffer van het blad Wired stond. Ada Fruit is een technologiebedrijf dat voor 100% in handen is van vrouwen. Via de website hobbyscope.nl kun je trouwens meerdere foto's van de locatie van Papa Juliet 2 NOS bekijken en van de amateurs die bij de uitrol van het relais al daar betrokken zijn. Je kunt naar de foto's doorklikken vanuit het artikel met als titel Update Opstelpunt Curaçao. Hamnieuws gaat verder in op de zendamateurs op Curaçao. Hoeveel zijn het er? Wat voor type vergunningen zijn er? En wat zijn de verschillen in amateurbanden tussen daar en hier? Amateur radio, often called ham radio, is really many hobbies and passions under one name. From studying the stars, to creating new computer applications, to practicing their emergency communication skills every June on field day weekend. Hams enjoy serving the community in many ways. Daily Minutes zijn dagelijks om 1900 uur te beluisteren op PI2 NOS en ochtends om half elf. Aanvullende informatie bij de uitzendingen is te vinden op www.pa0ete.nl. Wil verder gerust je tips, commentaar en desnoods priet praten naar xapenstaartjexdv.me.
Wij hebben nog een verzoek. Ja. Als je in de auto de SSTV beelden wilt ontvangen. Zoek dan alsjeblieft een parkeerplaats op. Doe dat niet terwijl je rijdt. Dit is Papa Alfa 0, Eco Tingo Eco voor de Daily Minutes met een nieuwsupdate voor vandaag 14 juni 2016. Dit is het bulletin van dinsdag. Vandaag een paar mosse woorden. Hebben ze nou wel of niet met de luchtvaart te maken? En een SSTV plaatje van een oord veel warmer dan hier in PD50. De Vieron zoekt een nieuwe voorzitter voor de PR-commissie van de vereniging. De Vieron Public Relations Commissie verzorgt het interne en externe communicatiebeleid, ofwel Public Relations, zoals te vinden in de vacature op Vieron.nl. Het gaat erbij om alle publieke uitingsvormen van de vereniging, van papier tot aan Facebook. Daarnaast adviseert de voorzitter van de PR-commissie het Vieron HB. Het betreft dus een vrijwilligersbaan voor iemand met ervaring op het gebied van PR en communicatie. Het antennebureau van AT heeft een nieuwe brochure, alles over antennes, die zoals het antennebureau stelt voorziet in een behoefte vanuit de samenleving. Waarom moet die antenne per se hier geplaatst worden en niet ergens verderop? Of heb ik ook inspraak als er bij mij in de buurt een antenne wordt geplaatst? Dit zijn twee veelgestelde vragen tijdens voorlichtingen die AT geeft. Ook gezondheid is een terugkerend onderwerp. Wat doen de elektromagnetische velden die van antennes afkomen met mijn gezondheid? Vragen van de burger hierover worden beantwoord en ook wordt aangegeven waar telecombedrijven zich aan moeten houden bij het plaatsen van een antenne. De titel van het eerste hoofdstuk in de brochure is Waarom zijn er antennes? Verder wordt voor niet-technici aangegeven hoe antennes werken, wat de gevolgen voor de gezondheid kunnen zijn en de regels voor het plaatsen van antennes. De brochure kan op papier worden besteld, maar makkelijker is natuurlijk om de pdf te downloaden vanaf www.antennebureau.nl. Rechts onder de foto op de voorpagina staat dan momenteel het artikel met als titel Nieuwe brochure. Met het artikel kun je ook de pdf downloaden. De site ham-dmr.nl met als eindredacteur PA3PM heeft een paar wijzigingen ondergaan. Meest in het oog springt de nieuwe URL hamdigitaal.nl. De site gaat dus niet meer met name over DMR alleen. Een nieuw artikel gaat bijvoorbeeld over een SDR-apparaat. Onderaan de site loopt een bannertje met breaking news waarvan Peter de Klok nog even moet bijzetten, want die loopt voor. Dat is overigens natuurlijk maar een kleinigheid. Ham minteken dmr.nl ging al meer en meer over zaken, meer dan alleen DMR. Het is denk ik daarom een goede ontwikkeling. De Poolse DXer Dom 3Z9DX meldt dat hij stand-by staat om ieder moment naar Noord-Korea te gaan voor een vervolg van zijn test van enkele maanden geleden vanuit het meest begeerde DXCC-land. Tom heeft bericht gekregen van de Noord-Koreaanse overheid dat ze hem zullen toestaan om gedurende vijf dagen actief te zijn vanuit het land dat niet zo makkelijk zijn deuren voor buitenlanders openzet. Op 20 en 21 december verscheen Dom voor het eerst spontaan vanuit het land en maakte toen 785 verbindingen, de meeste in Azië en toen op 15 meter. Aan het nieuwe bezoek zijn nieuwe regels verbonden. Hij mag maar op één band werken, ofwel 20, 15 of 10 meter en dat alleen in SSB. Boven Europa waren de afgelopen nachten bijzondere blauwverlichte wolken te zien. Deze blauwverlichte wolken bevinden zich aan de rand van waar de ruimte begint en worden gevoed door meteoroïden. Ze zijn te zien na zonsondergang, ze melden southgatearc.org en spaceweather.com en ze zullen heel gauw ook in Amerika te zien zijn. Op zondag 3 juli is het weer Alexanderson Day. Op die dag vinden er allerlei activiteiten plaats rond de Alexanderson machinezender in Zweden. De zender werkt in het VLF-gebied en is in feite niet meer dan een grote elektromotor met een dynamo, welke direct het nodige zendvermogen op de frequentie van 17,2 kHz opwekt. De signalen werden in het verleden vaak ontvangen met een upconverter voor een bestaande korte golfontvanger. Meer en meer wordt echter SDR gebruikt, waarbij op de geluidskaart van de PC een antenne wordt aangesloten. Vanavond vanaf 20.30 uur is de Diestar ronde op XRF 088B via Diestar, maar ook via DMR te beluisteren. Daarnaast kun je de ronde meeluisteren en terugluisteren via de website van Frans, Papa Delta 4, Fox, Mike, Juliet. Website is pd4fmj.nl. Om te luisteren kun je bovenaan op het tapje klikken.
Daily Minutes zijn dagelijks om 1900 uur te beluisteren op PI2 NOS en ochtends om half elf. Aanvullende informatie bij de uitzendingen is te vinden op www.pa0ete.nl. Wil verder gerust je tips, commentaar en desnoods priet praten naar xapenstaartjexdv.me. Toch is het leuk zo'n bovenregionale repeater. En eigenlijk gaat het ook best goed. Ja, zeker als je je bedenkt hoe groot het bereik is. Ja, en hoe druk het is. Eigenlijk zijn er maar twee grote ergernissen. Inderdaad, dat mensen geen lange break laten. Voor de Echelink gebruikers. En dat de mensen de repeater te lang alleen voor hun eigen gebruiken. Inderdaad. Als het zo druk is moet je eerlijk delen. Dus mensen. Gebruik de repeater niet te lang alleen voor je eigen. Dit is Papa Alfa Nul Eco Tango Eco voor de Daily Minutes met een nieuwsupdate voor vandaag 14 juni 2016. 15 juni 2016. Dit is het bulletin van woensdag. Verdikke, maar heb ik het verkeerd opgeschreven. Ik mag me vandaag niet verspreken. Dat wil zeggen, ik kan de uitzending niet overdoen als ik dat doe. Want ik ben een beetje laat. Maar goed, het zal wel lukken. Vandaag is er een morsen en een historisch SSTV plaatje. Zoals gewoonlijk onder andere op de smartphone te ontvangen. Gewoon met de microfoon via Android met de app Robot36. En via iOS met CQ SSTV. De website Media Magazine meldt dat er tot nu toe totaal 36 aanvragen bij AT zijn binnengekomen voor de laagvermogens AM regeling. Voor 1 watt zijn er 7 aanvragen en voor de 100 watt versie hier met de tijdslot 29 aanvragen. Er zijn geen aanvragen voor evenementenvergunningen binnengekomen. Deze week is AT begonnen met het uitgeven van vergunningen voor de middengolfband Nieuwe Stijl. AT is verder niet van plan om een overzicht van uitgegeven vergunningen voor deze categorie op haar website te plaatsen. Met dank aan Simon die me op dit onderwerp wees. Agentschap Telecom heeft gisteren haar jaarlijkse staat van de eter uitgebracht in een, vind ik, lastig te lezen interactieve online versie. Voordeel is wel dat er ook video is toegevoegd. Op een tablet zal het best goed werken, maar met een muis op de pc is het lastig schuiven met de panelen. Ik citeer de website. De vraag naar snelheid, capaciteit en bereikbaarheid van ons telecomnetwerk is het afgelopen jaar opnieuw toegenomen. De telecommunicatieketen groeit en vergunninghouders besteden prachtig. We steden veel specialistisch werk steeds vaker uit. Dit kan leiden tot misverstanden over aansprakelijkheden en verantwoordelijkheden. Zo stelt AT in haar jaarbericht over 2015 dus. De vraag naar snelheid en capaciteit op het gebied van telecommunicatie blijft toenemen. Het agentschap signaleert dat operators als reactie daarop investeren in hun netwerken. Om meer capaciteit te kunnen bieden hebben zij de laatste jaren veel straalverbindingen vernieuwd of vervangen. Peter Spijkerman, directeur, hoofdinspecteur van AT... Volgens Peter Spijkerman, directeur hoofdinspecteur van AT, zijn de mogelijkheden van telecommunicatie de afgelopen jaren explosief toegenomen. Dit vraagt volgens Spijkerman veel van het telecomnetwerk. Nederland heeft een robuuste telecominfrastructuur die een stevige toename van dataverkeer gewoon aan kan. Doordat operators blijven investeren in hun netwerken, blijven vraag en aanbod met elkaar in de pas lopen, al dus de directeur hoofdinspecteur. Vergunninghouders besteden hun frequentieplanning of installatie en onderhoud van apparatuur steeds vaker uit aan gespecialiseerde bedrijven. Deze bedrijven leggen technische installaties aan of programmeren zendapparatuur. Dat ontzorgt de vergunninghouders, maar kan ook leiden tot misverstanden over aansprakelijkheid en verantwoordelijkheid. Peter Spijkerman zegt hierover, de vergunninghouder blijft te alle tijden verantwoordelijk voor zijn frequentiegebruik en het naleven van de vergunningvoorwaarden. Mochten daar misverstanden over ontstaan, dan zullen we hem daarop aanspreken. Vorig jaar heeft het agentschap een beeldvormend onderzoek gedaan naar het frequentiegebruik van 26 zogenaamde BRZO-bedrijven in het Rijnmondgebied. Dat zijn bedrijven waar grote hoeveelheden gevaarlijke stoffen aanwezig zijn. En de gevolgen van onzorgvuldig frequentiegebruik die kunnen bijzonder groot zijn uh, daardoor, ook voor de omliggende regio's. Bij 21 van hen zijn overtredingen geconstateerd, variërend van afwijken van de vergunningsvoorwaarden tot illegaal frequentiegebruik. Bij gecontroleerde bedrijven bleek weinig frequentiekennis aanwezig te zijn. Dit jaar zal AT het belang van zorgvuldig frequentiegebruik binnen de BRZO-sector onder de aandacht brengen. Op de website van AT staan voor de betrokkenen een aantal tips waarmee bedrijven kunnen nagaan of het frequentiegebruik binnen de eigen organisatie goed is geregeld. De kans is niet zo groot dat het signaal van het baken in Nederland wordt gehoord, maar onmogelijk is het zeker niet. In Kaapstad in Zuid-Afrika is een nieuw 2 meter baken in de lucht gekomen. Baken heeft als roepnaam Zulu Sierra 1 Tango Whisky Oscar en zit op 144 435 MHz. Het baken staat op een hoog gebouw in het centrum van de stad. Zendvermogen is 20 watt en de antenne is een 5 elements Yagi, horizontaal in noord-noordoostelijke richting. Niet echt richting Nederland dus, maar je weet tenslotte nooit. 
Radio TV Nederlands.nl meldt trouwens dat Atlantis Radio 1521, volgens mij was dat eerst een piraat, een van de aanvragers voor een middengolfvergunning is. En dat de zender vanaf vandaag haar vergunning van AT hoopt te ontvangen, of op vandaag, voor een frequentie van 1395 kHz op de middengolf. Het station heeft zijn naam daarom veranderd in Atlantis Radio 1395. De zender zal vanaf aanstaand weekend op die frequentie in de lucht komen. Eens kijken wie het station het eerst weet te ontvangen. Het station is officieel pas op, uh, zal officieel pas op 3 juli geopend worden. En het is een Golden Oldie zender. De website van het station is atlantisradio.eu zonder streepjes. Daily Minutes zijn dagelijks om 1900 uur te beluisteren op PI2 NOS en ochtends om half elf. Aanvullende informatie bij de uitzendingen is te vinden op www.pa0ete.nl. Wil verder gerust je tips, commentaar en desnoods priet praten naar xapenstaartjexdv.me. Woon jij al lang in de Havermoutstraat? Hoe kom je erbij? Ik woon niet in de Havermoutstraat. Ik woon op het Cornflakespad. Oké. Okay. En waar woon jij dan? Ja, in de milkshake buurt. Op het banaan met ananaspad. Nog problemen met plaatsen van antennes daar? Helemaal niet. Ik heb de antenne mastwit met een rode spiraalbies geschilderd. En er zit bovenaan een knik in. Tegen de buren heb ik gezegd dat het een rietje is. Dit is Papa Alfa 0 Eco Tingo Eco voor de Daily Minutes met een nieuwsupdate voor vandaag 16 juli 20, juni 2016. Ik ga me steeds vaker begissen, vergissen aan het begin, nou, dat gaat lekker. Dit is het bulletin van donderdag. Ik hoop dat de rest van de uitzending beter gaat. Vandaag uiteraard de mosse worden in de uitzending plus een SSTV plaatje met een bijzondere antenne locatie. Enfin, dat zullen we wel zien, hij is in PD50. Er is weer een melding primair gebruik bijgekomen. Op vrijdag 24 juni de gehele dag, de hele 13 centimeter band, iets met paarden. Volgens mij in de regio Rotterdam, maar dat had ik niet opgeschreven. Ja, nog even een reminder voor de Gooise Vossenjacht aanstaande zondag. Het is een pieperjacht op 2 meter. Inschrijven kan vanaf 1300 uur, start is 13.30 uur. Duurt maximaal 2 uur, maximaal 5 kilometer. Ik weet niet of je er ook pijldozen kunt lenen, maar dat kun je vast via de gegevens op de site wel te weten komen. Meer informatie is dus te vinden op de website van de Veron in het gooi, pi4rcg.nl. Voor wie met een System Fusion repeater wil beginnen, is er weer de kans om goedkoop aan een repeater te komen. Het gaat om een DR1 minteken XE repeater in een 19 inch behuizing die werkt op twee banden. De prijs is tot 30 juni 500 euro. Je moet er wel snel zijn. Informatie hierover is te vinden op southgatearc.org. De nieuwsbrief van het IARO Monitoring System van de maand mei is verschenen. Het IARO MS is wat vroeger de Intruder Watch heette. En de nieuwsbrief beschrijft weer de vele schendingen vanwege oneigenlijk gebruik van onze amateurfrequenties door militairen, overheden, bedrijven en andere piraten. De nieuwsbrief begint dit keer met diverse ledlampen en PLC's met een identiteitscrisis omdat ze zich als zender gedragen. De Russische marine die zit al 10 jaar met RTTY op 14192 in de 20 meter band. Het is net als op het Noorse Spitsbergen waar de Russen doen alsof hun kolenmijnen op eigen grondgebied staan en niet op Noors grondgebied. Ze doen net alsof ze er thuis zijn. 
Het Poolse leger, tegenwoordig onderdeel van de NAVO, heeft zijn Oost-Europese streken na 25 jaar kennelijk ook nog niet afgeleerd. Ze storen de onderste anderhalve kilohertz in het DX-gedeelte dus van de 40 meter band. Die is van amateurs. Ondanks optreden van de Duitse AT, de Bundesnetzagentur, nog altijd geen verandering. En de Sound of Hope was er ook weer. Een zender op 18.080 in onze 17 meter band, afkomstig uit Taiwan. Zoals gewoonlijk vergezeld van Grote Broer en volger de Volksrepublieken Buren met hun stoorzenders. Dit is nog maar een kleine greep. Je kunt het IARO Monitoring System binnenkort bezoeken. Ze hebben een stand op de Hemradio in Friedrichshaven. Ja, komende zondag is het Kids Day in de VS. Ik heb begrepen dat dat in het verleden wel eens niet synchroon liep met hier. Dat zal dus nog steeds van het geval zijn. In elk geval krijgen die dag in de VS de jongsten onder ons de kans om met de amateur microfoon kennis te maken. Geef ze ruim baan en respect. Het betreft mogelijk de toekomstige generatie hams. En die willen we natuurlijk niet afschrikken. Aanstaande zondag dus. Je kunt mijn stem trouwens ook op aanstaande zondag iedere week ook op de Korte Golf horen op het station de Mighty KBC op 9925 kHz in de 31 meter band. Dat gaat op de Antillen zelfs zonder repeaters. Deze uitzending is gericht op de VS en Canada waar het redelijk wat luisteraars heeft. De uitzending waarin ik een klein itemje doe vindt iedere week plaats in de nacht van zaterdag op zondag tussen 00 uur en 0200 UTC. Dat is heel laat tussen 2 uur en 4 uur lokale zomertijd. In de VS en op de Antillen echter is de uitzending tussen 8 en 10 uur zaterdagavond. Mijn rubriek in het programma zit op ongeveer 01.19 uur, dus 19 minuten over 1 UTC. De uitzending wordt later op de dag nog een keer herhaald. Mogelijk is die uitzending in Europa op 6.095 kHz in de 49 meter band beter te ontvangen. Dat is van 8 uur UTC tot 10 uur UTC. Nederlandse zomertijd dus van 10 uur tot 12 uur ochtends. En mijn rubriek zit dan om 11 uur 19 lokale tijd. Bij de uitzendingen vinden met een zendvermogen van 125 kW plaats vanaf de op dit moment beste locatie voor korte golfuitzendingen. Het zendstation Nauwen nabij Berlijn, nog door de Oost-Duitsers voor hun propaganda gebouwd. Het onderwerp van komende zondag is, hoe kan het ook anders, de komst van PJ2 NOS op Curaçao. Daily Minutes zijn dagelijks om 1900 uur te beluisteren op PI2NOS en ochtends om half elf. Aanvullende informatie bij de uitzendingen is te vinden op www.pa0ete.nl. Wil verder gerust je tips, commentaar en desnoods priet praten naar xapenstaartjexdv.me. Do you suffer from the heartbreak of brain rot? Feeling bored, sluggish, listless? Not had a new idea in days? Using electronic gizmos without a clue why they work? Now there's help. Ham Radio. Guaranteed to stimulate your corroding neurons and open a whole new world of excitement. Side effects of ham radio usage include mental stimulation, desire for education, new career paths, understanding of technology, and cases of addiction have been reported. If you experience any of these symptoms, you're welcome. Ham Radio. It's not your granddaddy's radio anymore. Toch is het leuk, zo'n bovenregionale Antilliaanse repeater. Dit is Papa Alfa 0, Eco Tango Eco voor de Daily Minutes met een nieuwsupdate voor vandaag, 17 juni 2016. Dit is de beeld van vrijdag. Vandaag is er uiteraard weer morsen en een SSTV plaatje van opnieuw een bijzondere antenne locatie. Dit keer in PD90 om voldoende detail te kunnen behalen. 
Ik kreeg vanochtend van Berend PD1 ALO de suggestie om iets meer aandacht aan de amateurs op Curaçao te geven in de uitzendingen. En bijvoorbeeld ook het tijdstip te melden waarop de uitzendingen daar te beluisteren zijn. Dat laatste wilde ik eigenlijk al doen. En sowieso wil ik voor het eind van de uitzending een keer wat nieuws inspreken. Bijvoorbeeld het mailadres is bij de huidige versie ook niet helemaal verstaanbaar. Ik wil best nog wel een keer zeggen overigens hoe blij ik ben met de komst van de mensen op de eilanden. Dat die daar nu ook de mogelijkheid hebben om mee te praten en te luisteren. Want ik ben er echt bijzonder blij mee. En uit reacties begrijp ik dat ik daarin ook beslist niet de enige amateur ben. Ik wil tegelijk ook niet de amateurs daar te veel afzonderen van de rest van de gebruikers. Dat heb ik ook niet gedaan bij de amateurs uit Zeeland die erbij kwamen, bij de ontvanger in België. En toen de hele grote, grote groep uit het noorden erbij kwam met de zender in Smilde. Maakt voor mij geen verschil of je in het Caribische deel van het Koninkrijk zit of in het Gooi of Limburg of in Groningen. Ik maak de uitzendingen voor mensen die in deze hobby geïnteresseerd zijn. Ik zou het trouwens wel leuk vinden om na de uitzending of via x apenstaatje xdv.me te horen of er ook mensen zijn die op Curaçao, Bonaire en of Aruba naar de uitzendingen luisteren. Wat misschien ook wel leuk is om te weten hoe er op de eilanden over die hele drukke repieten gedacht wordt in dat koude land hier. Dat mag zowel positief als negatief zijn. Niet alle repeaters hier zijn overigens zoals PI2 NOS. Dit is gewoon alleen maar een bijzonder succesvolle repeater. Wat vermoedelijk ook wel leuk is om te horen op de eilanden, en zeker ook van daaruit om ernaar te luisteren, dat is de Vierdaagse van Nijmegen, waarvan dit jaar de honderdste editie gehouden wordt. De Vierdaagse is een wandelmars die vier dagen lang door een heel mooi stukje van Gelderland wordt gehouden. Vorig jaar stond er tijdens de Vierdaagse een tijdelijke repeater van het PI2 NOS systeem in die stad. Diverse deelnemers, maar ook mensen langs de kant, hadden vorig jaar hun amateurapparatuur bij zich. En dat was bijzonder leuk om te volgen. De Vierdaagse vindt dit jaar plaats van 19 tot en met 22 juli, dus over ruim een Maand. In het Verenigd Koninkrijk is er een nieuw Baken GB3 UHF QRV op 70 centimeter. Baken bevindt zich bij Fairseat in Kent in Juliet Oscar 01 Echo Hotel. Het is een zusterbaken van het bekende baken op 2 meter GB3 VHF. Het UHF baken heeft een vergelijkbare antenne en antenne richting als de 2 meter versie om zo de propagatie te kunnen vergelijken. Identificatie gebeurt in Mossen op de oneven minuten en in JT65 op de even minuten, ook vergelijkbaar met het 2 meter zusterbaken. Frequentie van, het, uh, van GB3 UHF wordt gestabiliseerd door middel van een GPS ontvanger. De website van de beide bakens is gb3vhf.co.uk. Oh ja, het is wel handig als ik even de frequentie noem. Dat is 432430 MHz. Ook te ontvangen op de bekende web SDR op de Gebrandi-toren. Ja, en dan het volgende. Een luisteraar heeft me gevraagd of iemand nog videobanden kan lezen volgens het Charlie Victor Charlie systeem, het CVC systeem. Het apparaat waar het om gaat is een Funai. Volgens het type, baadje, type plaatje een Foxtrot 612 Victor. Maar als je gaat googlen dan kom je ook de Funai 212 tegen die er vergelijkbaar uitziet. Het betreft overigens een aantal historische opnamen van amateurevenementen die in dit systeem gemaakt zijn. En het, het betreft een aantal historische opnamen van amateurevenementen die in dit systeem gemaakt zijn. En het laatste apparaat van de betreffende amateur om een en ander af te spelen en op een ander systeem over te zetten, blijkt bij een poosje van ongebruikte geest te hebben gegeven. Je kunt reacties mailen aan het bekende mailadres x xdvme x-ray apenstaartje x-ray delta victor.mikeecho. En dat adres is eventueel ook te vinden op pnlete.nl. Astronaut Tim Pieck, KG 5BVU, is als het goed is vandaag alweer teruggekeerd naar de aarde. Tim Pieck was degene die de vele gesprekken met scholen op 145-800 hield, die hier in Europa zo uitstekend waren te ontvangen. Vergeet niet om vanavond naar de lange uitzending te luisteren vanaf half elf op PI3 UTR.
Daily Minutes zijn dagelijks om 1900 uur te beluisteren op PI2 NOS en ochtends om half elf. Aanvullende informatie bij de uitzendingen is te vinden op www.pa0ete.nl. Wil verder gerust je tips, commentaar en desnoods priet praten naar xapenstaartjexdv.me. Ik heb laatst een dipmeter gekocht. Wat is dat, een dipmeter? Dat weet ik ook niet, maar er zei iemand op de repeater dat die apparaten heel erg handig waren en dat je er vroeger zelfs niet zonder kon. Een dipmeter. Wat zou dat kunnen zijn? Ja, als het nou een dipsausmeter geweest zou zijn, dan had ik het wel geweten. Het gaat er natuurlijk niet alleen om wat die meter is, maar ook wat je ermee kunt doen. Ik weet wel wat een meter is, maar wat is nou een dip? Ik bedoel, elektronisch gesproken dan. Ik weet het trouwens al. Het is om te testen of je dipswitches goed staan. Amateur Radio Newsline, report number 2016, with a release date of Friday, June 17, 2016, to follow in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. The following is a QST, a noted DXer dies after a fall from a tower. Amateurs and CB radio operators team up seriously to watch the weather. Another NASA astronaut becomes a ham and a California city takes earthquake lessons from Nepal. All this and more in Amateur Radio Newsline report number 2016 coming your way right now. From around the world, this is Newsline, Amateur Radio's first independent on-the-air news and bulletin service. Now, reporting from Wadsworth, Ohio, Stephen Kenford, N8WB. This week's newscast opens with a word of a tragic accident that it's hit hard within the international ham radio community. Well-known DX expeditioner and DXer Milt Jensen, N5IA, of Verdun, New Mexico, died on June 9th after falling from a ham radio tower. Newsline Kent Peterson, KC0DGY, spoke with Jensen's wife, Ruline, KB5VTM. He was just an avid DX or contest person. If we got in the car, he was on the radio all the time. He loved building new things, the challenge of building a better antenna system. Newsline reached out to Milt Jensen's wife, Ruline, KB5VTM who shared some of her memories of Milt's de-expeditions. Actually, he did three. He went to Myanmar twice. The first time he went, I went with him. That was an eye-opener to me. And he had me get on, and I think I spent two minutes, and everybody was getting irritated at me because I didn't know what I was doing. So I got off and gave it back to him. He loved it. He and Robin Pritchell were there to do the 160 part. That was his main joy, was doing 160. Other than Myanmar, he went to Ducey Island with an international group, and I got on his Facebook the last couple of days, and they've all responded to it from Germany, Lithuania, and I don't remember what other countries, but it was a big one, and I always tease him about living on Gilligan's Island. That's about what that island looked like to me <laughs> with the pictures. Ruleen got her ham license just to stay in touch with Milt. He was always gone to a mountaintop to do something, He didn't have cell phones then. He convinced me to take a ham class and learn my code and take the test. I got my license so that I could get hold of him when I needed to. That didn't always work either. Milt worked for a power utility and learned climbing safety from them. He was trained in all the safety stuff. He always did tie off, tie off, tie off, have your gear on. So it wasn't that he was careless about climbing. On June 9th, Milt was in Tucson to help a fellow ham. The tower he was working on was for a friend, a fellow ham that lived in Tucson that doesn't climb. And so he went to do whatever tower work it was that needed to be done on his tower for him. Besides Ruline, two of Milt's sons also have ham licenses. My husband had told our oldest son, sometimes his hand went to sleep and he couldn't hang on. And so we're thinking that that's what it was because he stressed safety. If that was the case, I'm going to slap him when I get up to heaven. Milt Jensen, K5IA, was 73 years old. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Kent Peterson, KC0DGY. As a postscript to Milt's passing, we also note that a day later in Ratcliffe, Kentucky, police reported that a man was seriously injured after a fall of about 30 feet from an amateur radio tower. He remained conscious while emergency workers transported him to a hospital in Louisville, where, at press time, there were no further updates on his condition or what led to his fall. With both of these stories in mind, Amateur Radio Newsline urges listeners, on a personal note, to please adhere to strict safety practices when doing any tower work. Can CBers and ham radio operators work hand-in-hand? The answer is yes. 
in one Alabama county where we hear from Newsline Bobby Best, WX4ALA. In the community of weather watchers, the critical information passed by storm spotters who receive formal training from the National Weather Service is known as ground truth. Those details are lifelines. When serious weather hits, as it does often in tornado-prone places like Dixie Alley, comprising much of the southeast, Dixie Alley gets hit hard with severe weather, and right now, much of the region is bracing again for Atlantic hurricane season, which just started on June 1st. In Jefferson County, Alabama, the most populated county in that southern state, a unique kind of partnership has become paramount. Amateur radio operators passing along this vital ground truth alongside another group of radio operators as part of what some might consider an unlikely team. These other spotters are also trained by the Weather Service, work on the 11 meter band. That's right, you can find them on CB radio. The deployment of CBers and hams has been a priority for the Sylvan Springs Amateur Radio Club in western Jefferson County, and they're proud of their effort. According to James Keller, KF4JQP, a charter member and current president of the club, quote, we've reached out to members of the community that are NWS trained spotters, but that don't hold an amateur radio license, and invited them into our meetings and circles. While we would hope that one day they will become interested in gaining their amateur radio license, but until that day comes, there is a way that they can assist at saving lives, end quote. The Sylvan Springs Amateur Radio Club has installed at their EOC an 11 meter or CB radio base station with its antenna located high atop their ham tower. Keller added, whenever we go into a standby alert status, in addition to monitoring our own 2 meter repeater, as well as other severe weather nets, we also monitor 27.065 megahertz or channel 9, which is a reserved and restricted channel by the FCC for emergency communications only. Any information that we receive that meets the NWS criteria for severe weather, damage reports, or any other emergency traffic, we can then immediately pass it on via amateur radio to stations at the NWS, the EMA, the Red Cross, or even to Alabama's state EOC via 80 meters on our state's designated HF emergency frequency of 3.965 megahertz, end quote. CB and ham radio operators may seem at times to be on different parts of the spectrum in more ways than one, but the idea of this kind of teamwork is catching on in Jefferson County, Alabama. From the perspective of this meteorologist, such creative deployment of radio operators can only lead to expanded weather coverage, and in Dixie Alley, that's a good thing. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Bobby Best, WX4ALA in Jasper, Alabama. Speaking of weather, one New York ham's devotion to watching for storm systems has won him special recognition. Here is Newsline's Heather MB, KB3TZD. Dave Robinson, N4UAR of Oswego County, New York, isn't exactly a fair weather friend. What would be the point of that anyway? His skills and volunteer efforts are especially needed when bad storm systems roll in. He's a trained weather spotter in the Skywarn program of the National Weather Service and a member of the county's Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Services. More recently, Dave became an emergency communications honoree, receiving this year's RACES Service Award for his work in central New York, where he joined RACES in 2008. That work has not just garnered him honors, it has also kept him busy and made him a leader during drills as well as real weather emergencies. Dave was praised at a recent RACES meeting by Radio Officer Fred Koch, KA2HPG. Fred said, quote, Dave is one of the first to show up for RACES work details. He is a quiet individual who is invaluable to the group as a leader and a mentor, end quote. He now has the award to remind him of that just in case he gets too busy during the storm season ahead. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Heather MB, KB3TZD. There's a new ham in town, actually above town. He's way, way above town. He's NASA astronaut Scott Tingle, now known as KG5NZA. Having passed his technician exam on June 3rd, he is now getting ready to join the amateur radio on the International Space Station, or ARIS program. Although amateur radio studies are optional during the two years of astronaut training he began in Russia, his interest in ham radio grew during his studies, and he was determined to exercise that option. Meanwhile, three amateurs aboard the ISS are to be back home on Earth Saturday, June 18th. They are Expedition 47 Commander Tim Copra, KE5UDN, Flight Engineer Tim Peak, KG5BVI slash GB1SS, and Yuri Malenchenko, RK3DUJP. So with the crew up there always in transition, Scott Tingle can expect to find plenty of room when he launches with the Expedition 53 crew in the fall of 2017. 
time for you to identify your station. We are the Amateur Radio Newsline, heard on bulletin stations around the world, including the W4WVP repeater in Arlington, Virginia, on Tuesday nights at 7. In amateur radio, as in most things, it's not just what you know, but who you know. One ham in Queensland, Australia, found that out a few years ago when the who you know ended up being an astronaut from Australia. Here's Amateur Radio Newsline Graham Kemp, VK4BB, with that story. Shane Lyon, VK4K8Z of Central Queensland, didn't exactly have high-flying ambitions on that day 18 years ago when his signal was picked up unexpectedly by Australia's man in space, Andy Thomas, VK5MIR, on board the Russian space station, Mir. It turned out to be more than just a memorable QSO. That radio connection got him to thinking about his personal connections to space and how many learning opportunities await in the great vast void above the Earth. Not long after, Shane was invited to join as one of three Australian volunteers working with NASA, supporting amateur radio on the International Space Station. Surely Shane could relate to the thrill students would have connecting with voices in space, since he'd experienced that himself. He would also be on standby, having his shack available to NASA in case of an emergency, such as lost communication link with the space station. Along the way, Shane made some important ground-based connections too. Now, in local schools, he brings and demonstrates one of his tracking stations to students and helps them have the same space experience he enjoyed with Andy Thomas. And that happened recently when he helped students at Glenmore State High School in Rockhampton contact Kim Copra, KE5UDN, commander of the ISS. As part of the RS volunteer team, he's working to help plan plenty more connections like that. If space is a void, Shane Lyon helps to be out there personally, doing his very best to fill that void, with the sound of ham radio, of course. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Graham Kemp, VK4BB. There's a great distance between Nepal and the state of California, but when it comes to being vulnerable to earthquakes, the two are a lot closer than most people can imagine. Here's Amateur Radio Newsline Skeeter Nash, N5ASH. The story of the 2015 Nepal earthquake is a story worth telling again and again, not just because it's important to remember the horror of that April day, but to learn from the response by radio amateurs who stepped in. That was the narrative that one of the amateurs from Kathmandu shared earlier this month on a visit to Santa Clara, California. Sanjeev Pandey, 9N1SP, made his presentation to an audience of about 100, comprising Santa Clara firefighters, Aries and Racies members, Bayonet participants, and others in that city. Pandey's visit was arranged to help in fine-tuning earthquake response in this California region, especially since the Kathmandu Valley, where the April 2015 quake occurred, has a pattern of fault lines similar to those beneath this Silicon Valley city. Pandey told his listeners, quote, The Nepali people have gone through a tremendous ordeal. If our experience can help others in different parts of the world to better prepare for disasters, then this can be regarded as a positive outcome, end quote. Pandey had come to the U.S. for the International Microwave Symposium, where he talked about ham radio in post-secondary education. But he was pleased to be able to share how ham radio provided emergency response and continued to make post-quake relief available. The magnitude 7.9 quake is considered to be the worst to hit Nepal in 80 years. His hosts and listeners had something to share with him as well. He was given two handheld transceivers as gifts to scouts in Nepal from local scout leader Richard Silkebacken, KM6CPH, and members of the Monterey Bay Council's Cub Scout Pack 32. The Global Nepali Professional Network also received a certificate of recognition from Congress, presented by Representative Mike Honda. It was the network's Radio Mala program that built two ham radio repeaters, which were the only ones able to operate in Nepal during the quake. Speaking of repeaters, Pandey made note of their successful operation and encouraged licensed hams attending the presentation to join him and his fellow hams on the N91SP repeater via IRLP and Echo Link. They'll be listening, as always. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Skeeter Nash, N5ASH. Hams in Malaysia associate the call sign 9M2RDX with a top DXer, a mentor, a friend. This month, however, he became a silent key. Here's Newsline's Jason Daniels, VK2LAW, with more. Members of the Malaysian Amateur Radio Transmitter Society are grieving the loss of Mode Rizal Mahmud 9 Mike 2 Romeo Delta X-Ray. 
who became a silent key on the 12th of June in a Malaysian hospital. The award-winning DXer was a noted contester and beloved Elmer, who was also active in scouting. Since becoming licensed in 2006, he filled his life with amateur radio activities. His friend Piju, 9 Mike 2 Papa Juliet Uniform, who notified amateur radio newsline of Rizal's death, described him as, quote, a great man, down to earth, humble, a motivated and dedicated QSL manager, also a scout leader, a great motivator, who used to hold ham radio introduction classes and was involved in emergency communications. He helped his local ham radio community and also our national ham radio club. A hospital medical assistant by profession, he was described by his friend Piju as a kind and helpful guy. As seen on his profile page on QRZ, he was also unflinching in his love of amateur radio. The very bottom of his biography page displays this sentiment, Life is simple. Eat. Sleep. DX. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Jason Daniels, VK2LAW. In the world of DX, there are still a few remaining days to work Koji, JM1CAX, who will stay on in Gambia as C5 and X until June 18. QSLs should be directed to the logbook of the world. Nobuaki, JA0JHQ, is active as 9N7NH from Kathmandu, Nepal, from June 16th to the 20th, and will participate in the All-Asian DX contest on June 18th and 19th. QSL via his home call. Using the call sign 3B8 slash M0RCX, Robert M0RCX is operating holiday style from Maritis until July 14th. QSL manager is EB7DX. Listen for John K9EL working as FS slash K9EL from St. Martin Island until June 23rd. He is on all bands 80 to 6 meters working CW, SSB, and RIDI. QSLs can be obtained via club log OQRS. There's nothing like kicking back on a sunny day afloat in the South Pacific, doing a little low power transmitting on 30 meters. As the weather turns warmer, what ham wouldn't envy this kind of privilege? Okay. Well, that call sign doesn't belong to any OM or even a YL, but a marine buoy with the call sign ZL1SIX. That spells B-U-O-Y for marine buoy. This is a solar-powered buoy being carried steadily on the waters of the Pacific Ocean where it was launched from a yacht this past May 17th. Being at sea like this can be a good thing. In this case, the ocean floater is helping track sea currents and propitation. New Zealand amateur Bob Sutton, ZL1RS, noted in a published report that its weak signal on WSPR and JT9 modes has been reporting on the tides, current, and wind, also sending its battery voltage, position, and information about the temperature. To tune in, try dialing to 10.1387 MHz for WSPR. For JT9 signal, be listening just above the whisper band at 1730 Hz on the waterfall. You'll get everything but that nice South Pacific breeze. With thanks to Allen Labs, the ARRL, CQ Magazine, Facebook, Hap Holly and the Rain Report, the IARU, Monica Grimaldo of Tuscan News Now, QSL.net, Southgate Amateur Radio News, Ted Rando's QSO Radio Show, Wireless Institute of Australia, WTWW Shortwave, and you, our listeners. That's all from Amateur Radio Newsline. Please send emails to our address at newsline at arnewsline.org. More information is available at Amateur Radio Newsline's only official website located at www.arnewsline.org. June 30th will be here before you know it. That's our deadline to nominate candidates for the Bill Pasternak Young Ham of the Year Award. Please visit our website at arnewsline.org and click on the tab that says YHOTY for information and an application. Remember to mail your applications to the New York address printed on the application. For now, with Karen Eve Murray, KD2GUT at the news desk in New York, and our news team worldwide, I'm Stephen Kinford, NAWB in Wadsworth, Ohio, saying 73. And as always, we thank you for listening. Amateur Radio Newsline is copyright 2016. All rights reserved. Howdy, folks. Jeremy, KF7IJZ from the Ham Radio 360 podcast, standing here with George, KJ6VU. George, what do you think? I think Dayton's going to be really hot this year. There's some really exciting new radios. There's new SDR radios. There's new portable QRP rigs. It looks really interesting. 
I'm standing here once again at the Ham Source booth. We were here last year checking out some of their power accessories and their uh, power pole distribution blocks. And I stopped because I saw a giant banner for BioNO Power, which is a new battery manufacturer that I became aware of this year, and a lot of hams are excited about their products. I'm standing here with Kevin Zanjani. That's correct, Jeremy. It's a great opportunity to be here at the Dayton Hamvention with HamSource, John Kalatai with HamSource. Uh, my name is Kevin uh, with BioNO Power. We're here uh, bringing out all of the products, uh, showing all the new types of uh, lithium iron phosphate batteries for ham radio applications. Um, all of the batteries include uh, power pole connectors that connect directly to the radios, uh, super compact, lightweight, 2,000 plus charge cycles, um, very flat and stable uh, voltage response on there compared to lead acid batteries. Um, they don't uh, gas up. They're much lighter compared to other batteries as well. Um, we're also featuring various types of uh, power packs, exciting power packs that include um, built-in battery with a solar controller and an inverter, all in one unit that you can uh, plug in a solar panel into it as well. So there are a lot of uh, really cool and exciting offerings here at the Hamvention. Uh, that's again here at the HamSource, uh, Biono Power here with HamSource uh, offering the products and we're very excited to be here. All right, so let's start with your batteries. Your power modules, what I'd seen previously is you have both the traditional like shrink-wrapped right, or shrink-wrapped packs as well as packs that fit into like the traditional U-groups from lead-acid batteries. And I notice on your banner you also say you have LiPo batteries for RC and then LifePo for applications that are more, you know, for a ham radio. For your LifePo packs, are what's that, what group size batteries are you guys making? What capacities? So for the LifePo lithium iron phosphate batteries, uh, we have all of the traditional replacements to the lead acid, lead acid ones. So you'll find uh, like a 12 amp hour uh, in lithium iron phosphate will replace a standard one that you'll find uh, in an SLA configuration that's uh, 12 or 15 amp hours. We also offer uh, 8 amp hour and 9 amp hour lithium iron phosphate batteries that will replace the traditional uh, 7, 8, and 9 SLA batteries as well. So um, there's a lot of... Uh, good replacements for that application um, all of the batteries include the protection circuit module in there and then you can hook everything up and be on your way so now talking about that module a lot of batteries will have the over voltage over current under voltage protection do you guys have under voltage protection so i can't kill the battery by discharging it too far yeah that's correct all of the batteries include the protection circuit module in there that prevents against the over discharge uh, uh, protection so it has under voltage protection um it will essentially the battery will shut down once it reaches its cutoff voltage um so it protects the batteries um and uh you can then bring them back up without any issues so it's a pretty cool feature inside of lithium iron phosphate batteries compared to sla batteries which um as you know if you over discharge it that can be all that can be a problem so there's a significant advantages to using uh, uh, lithium iron phosphate batteries um, for, for ham radio applications. Among other applications for electronics, you can also use it uh, for other things as well. So if I look at these packs, a lot of competing packs that are sold in these similar SLA form factors have the circuitry in it to be able to connect to a traditional three-stage SLA charger and do the voltage and current transformation as appropriate for lithium chemistry. Can I take your battery and connect it to a battery tender, or do I need a charger made specifically for lithium chemistry? So as long as the charger is putting out a voltage between 14 to 15 volts, it will take the charge without any problems. Um, we do bundle the batteries uh, with the charger just in case customers they ask. So um, the bundles tend to be very popular, but as I mentioned, yeah, if you're within that range, you're okay. All right. I also notice, as you mentioned, there are some solar panels sitting here and some power packs. Tell us about those. So the solar panels here, we have foldable solar panels here. They're 28-watt solar panels. Um, they are super compact, lightweight. You can put them into a backpack, uh, take them on the go. Uh, they have both USB as well as uh, DC barrel output. Um, so you can plug that directly into, uh, you'll actually use what's called a solar charge controller uh, that will plug the panel into that and then that goes into the battery itself um, as I mentioned you can also use the USB output for powering your phones as well as uh, other devices as well alright how many amp hours in those packs so um, the, you mean the foldable panels the foldable panels are 28 watt panels um, but we have a separate power pack unit that is a, includes a uh, 12 volt 10 amp hour battery which is 
equivalent to 120 watt hours, which I'm holding here in front of Jeremy, um, and it has all of the uh, ability to be charged using uh, AC as well as solar and uh, USB output on the front as well as DC output and then the inverter on the back. And the charge controller that's in there, is it a traditional pulse width modulation or is it maximum PowerPoint tracking? So it's going to be actually, it's, it's a separate type of uh, charge controller that's geared for lithium iron phosphate batteries that does the constant current and then switches the constant voltage charging. So we've tailored that charge controller specifically for a lithium iron phosphate batteries. Okay, and anything else new this year? Uh, we're offering expanded product lines for the power pack offerings. Um, so this includes the uh, battery as, along with the um, inverter as well as the uh, solar charge controller all in one unit. It's a very wow. exciting offering. And uh, as I mentioned, we're very excited to be here with HamSource um, at Ham Nation with John. Um, and so it's a really exciting event. And did you guys, are, I'm assuming, are your products RF quiet? Yeah, there's no RF hash coming out of it. It's all RF quiet for ham applications. Awesome, because that's usually a problem with a lot of other charge controller manufacturers. They don't take that into account because, shocking, hams aren't their number one customer. If our listeners wanted to know more about pro- your products, where would they go? So you're going to go and visit uh, hamsource.com. Uh, we're here uh, with John. And uh, you're going to go to that website. And if there's any other further information, um, you can reach John uh, through HamSource, and then he'll direct us. Uh, to buy on a power as well. So, All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. All right. Appreciate it. And uh, 73s. Actually, one last question. Is there anything at Dayton you came to look at or you can't live without? I have, uh, this would be my first Hamvention uh, at Dayton. So I'm going to be checking out all the exciting new products as well from all the different uh, other manufacturers, uh, the radio manufacturers. And um, it'll be a really cool event. So I'm looking forward to checking stuff out. All right, Kevin, thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Appreciate it. Hi, this is Mike, N8WFF, from Dishtronics, Tentech, Alpha, Mtron, and you're listening to Ham Radio 360. I'm here at the AirSpy booth uh, with Joe McElhaney. What was your call sign again? KR3P. KR3P. And you guys are the proprietors of AirSpy.us, correct? We're the USA distributor. Actually, we cover the entire Western Hemisphere. Wow, that's a lot bigger than I thought. So we just did an episode on software-defined radios, and our guest, uh, Gerald, made me aware of your product. And I rushed over here on Thursday before the show even started to buy uh, my own AirSpy. So tell us what you brought to Dayton this year. Well, we have a few products we brought. We brought the original AirSpy, which is a software-defined radio that in itself covers 24 to 1800 megahertz. And we'll show you an instantaneous 10 megahertz bandwidth uh, chunk. Uh, there's a software called Spectrum Spy, which now will let you display virtually the entire coverage of the unit on one screenshot. Wow. And is that different than SDR Sharp? That is, it comes with SDR Sharp. It's written by the same guy. Um, the, uh, the package comes with SDR Sharp, ADSB Spy, which is an ADSB program, and Spectrum Spy, which is a Spectrum display program. So for our listeners who aren't familiar with ADSB, what what is ADSB and why why would somebody care? From a ham perspective, ADSB can be considered the APRS of the sky. It's used to track aircraft across the United States and across the globe. It's very popular in, in Europe and it's becoming more popular in the USA as more aircraft are equipped with that service. All right, and in addition to the AirSpy, what else did you guys bring? Well, we have a, a brand new product called the AirSpy Mini. It is a plug-in dongle based on the AirSpy. It has the same specs. Uh, it only covers a 6 megahertz instantaneous bandwidth rather than 10. But it's uh, considerably smaller, although the AirSpy in itself is not a huge unit. In fact, we have a number of people that uh, they are interested in the AirSpy. I show it to them, and they say, oh, I didn't realize it was this small. Because a lot of the other software-defined radios are fairly sizable units. Ours is approximately two inches by an inch and a half by a little over an inch uh, thick. And so I bought a Mini from you on Thursday, and for those of you who are familiar with the RTL-SDR style dongles, it's actually a tiny bit smaller than the RTL-SDR.com dongle that I bought. Yes, it is. Uh, It's about, I would say, maybe half of the square millimeter size. Okay, and as I understand it, you guys also have a transverter? We have the spyverter, which is, in the simplest terms, an upconverter for HF. 
Uh, it expands the 24 megahertz lower limit of the AirSpy down to almost zero megahertz. Okay, so that basically lets it have HF coverage. Exactly. HF and even, uh, even below broadcast. And that, combined with the AirSpy, would give you coverage of just about any radio signal you would want to receive, with the exception of anything that would be over 1,800 megahertz, such as if you were doing something with, uh, with Wi-Fi. Okay, and one of the other exciting things, you guys have a prototype of a new product here. Okay, it's not really a new product, but... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't realize it wasn't a new product. It's not a new product. It's new for us. We, are, uh, we have just completed negotiations with the manufacturer to sell that on our website. And uh, what's great about that is it not only gives the AirSpy... The AirSpy in itself has an accuracy that is it's very stable, uh, unlike some of the uh, dongles that tend to drift around a little bit. But even with the uh, excellent specs of the AirSpy, the GPS disciplined oscillator combined with that takes the uh, frequency error in the neighborhood of how many parts per trillion, which if you're below one gigahertz, you're pretty much going to be exactly on frequency. That's incredible. And so, yes, I didn't mention, but GPSDO is a GPS discipline oscillator. So basically there's a GPS receiver that feeds its signal into this box. Is that how that works? That's exactly it. Uh, and what's great about our unit that we're going to be selling is that it has two outputs. So you can do a few things with that. First of all, you can run two air spies if you're doing uh, SDR-based uh, Doppler uh, direction finding. Or you can set one output to run the air spy, and a second output you can set to 120 megahertz, which is the local oscillator frequency of the spyverter. Unfortunately, there's not a stock input on the spyverter to accept that 120 megahertz, but it's an easy mod to replace the oscillator signal built in with the GPSDO, and again, that gives you that same accuracy on HF, and when you're talking about HF, you're, you're going to be uh, within uh, millihertz of the frequency that you want to be. All right, and so what does the output of the GPSDO look like? The output is a square wave. It's uh, zero to three volts. Um, and it, sound, it sounds like it's configurable because I'm assuming the, the AirSpy uses a traditional 10 megahertz signal? Yes, it does. The second output is configurable not to any frequency, but to several frequencies, including the 120 megahertz local oscillator frequency of the Spyverter. All right, and for those who couldn't make it to Dayton and take advantage of the fact that you actually have minis in stock, which is not something that the rest of the Internet seems to be able to say, if our uh, listeners wanted to pick up your products, where would they go? Our website is airspy.us, and uh, we currently have uh, the minis in stock. I can't guarantee that after the show we will. We do ha have more on order. We are expecting those within a couple of weeks. Uh, it's hard to keep uh, new products like that in stock because of the demand. Uh, right now, we do have a sufficient stock of the AirSpy and Spyverter and just about anything else that's on our website, unless specifically st uh, stated that it's a pre-order item or an item that, uh, uh, that we may have low stock on. But we, we try to keep the website updated with uh, information that this item is you know, not currently in stock or, uh, or is. All right, and then finally, I ask all of our guests, or most of our guests, when I remember, have you had a chance to get outside the booth yet and check anything out? Unfortunately, that's the one problem with selling inside, or even in the flea market. You are at the show on business. You don't have a chance to enjoy the show, which I do miss somewhat. Uh, it would be great to, to get around and see what kind of deals there are to be had, because I know there's a lot of them out in the flea market and inside, but... Uh, what can I say? It's a sacrifice you have to make to sell. All right, Joe, thank you so much for your time, and uh, I can't wait to get home and play with my air spy more. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, I hope you enjoy it very much, and if you have any questions, just give us an email. I'd be glad to help you out with anything I can. All right, outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, I haven't uh, been on much, but it is K4CDN, and I am Hamvention. I'm here in Hamvention, and I am with one of our former show guests, one of our good friends of the show, as we follow him around the parks of the uh, nation's capital. It's KB1HQS, the number one park activator. I had to say that. Let me say it again. The number one park activator in the National Parks on the Air non-contest. 
It's Stuart. Stuart, how you doing, man? I'm doing excellent. I have no complaints. I'm at Dayton, and I'm having a blast. You've been here two days at least, and uh, you, you haven't bought you a KX2? Well, I took a look at it. It's a, it's a pretty sweet radio, but I have not, now. I don't know if I can trade it in. I did throw my uh, KX3 away in the trash can in anticipation for the uh, new KX2, but I'm um, still looking. And I followed him up, so it's now, now I have his uh, former well-used. I'm, we're, we're just kidding, folks. We don't throw radios away. So uh, I, this is my first trip to Dayton. I, I'm sure you come quite often, mm-hmm. I'd guess. Um, how is this trip compared to some in your past? Actually, this is my first trip here, believe it or not. Really? Yep. Of course, I lived in Maine at the time, so you know, making the trip from Maine to, to Ohio is kind of a long trip. But considering I'm in the D.C. area now, it's pretty easy. And you're here with your OEM? Here with the old man, yep. How did that trip go? Did you learn anything across, uh, across from the, uh, the, uh, the other coast? Well, he's a uh, retired petroleum engineer, so I had an eight-hour lecture on geology of the glaciers uh, for Ohio, uh, West Virginia, and Virginia. So it was, kind of, uh, it was pretty educational. So it is Hamvention, and that's very important to the hobby. Uh, Did you have any second thoughts about coming because you may miss this weekend worth of activating? I have to admit, I I had withdrawals on the way. I haven't operated a radio in probably four days. So last night while I was in the hotel, um, I decided to start my own program of hotels on the air. And I actually activated the first one. It was a Hampton Inn, and the designator code was uh, Hotel Indigo 01. And I had 10 contacts. Some people had no clue what I was talking about, but the rest did, and uh, it was good times. Now, will there be uh, QSL cards for that? Uh, there will. There'll be QSL cards and uh, certificates, and uh, check out my website for details on it. Yeah, and you can find a link to his website on the hamradio360.com site, as well as the KB1HQS, is it dot .com? Dot .com. Yeah. Dot .com. KB1HQS. His name is Stuart. He is the number one activator right now. And people say, oh, how do you get so many parks? If they've missed the show that you were on with us, tell us how you're activating so many parks right now. Uh, well, it's two things. Number one, I live in the D.C. area, and there's probably 50 parks within an hour's drive, so it makes it really easy. But if you have a park that's near you, take the laptop that you're using or the desktop, step away from the desk or the couch, grab your radio, get in the car, and go activate a park. That's pretty much what it comes down to. You just have to go do it. Getting on the air. Get on the air. Also, Stuart, thank you for uh, stopping by. It's, it's been a blast to get to meet you guys. You can't see this because this is audio, but I have to like extend my arm to its fullest capacity to uh, get the microphone up to Stuart so that you can hear him speak. Stuart, thanks again for dropping by. Thanks, Kay. I appreciate it. All right, 73, y'all. We'll get uh, George and Jeremy back with you in a bit. This is K4CDN Clear. I'm here at the Connect Systems booth with Jerry Wanger. Did I get that right? It's actually Wanger, but uh, anything as close is fine. All right, I can at least get KK6 LFS correct. And Connect Systems, of course, lit the, uh, the DMR market on fire several years ago by offering incredibly affordable, well-built uh, DMR radios for amateur use and also commercial use, correct? Uh, that's correct. It's, uh, commercial business is actually much larger than amateur business. So, but uh, we really liked the amateur market because it's more fun. Well, I, I know that every you guys have been out here for at least, what, the last three, four years? Uh, three years. I remember I was in the, uh, the D-Star presentation when you made another major announcement of the uh, Charlie Sierra 7000, which is uh, the radio that I'll call the Rosetta Stone of digital modes. And I know there's been a lot of rumor on the Internet and lots of talk of the untimely demise and this project will never happen. But you literally just showed me an assembled or partially assembled, partially populated prototype. It's sitting right here. Yes. Uh, the reason why it took us so long to get to this point is the original approach we wanted to use wouldn't work right. We uh, went through the trouble of designing a different version of this thing, but uh, we couldn't do what we wanted until the technology caught up to what we were trying to do. The original approach was going to use some Chinese parts, but the problem was we couldn't get enough information to even use it. (laughs) Uh, The the manufacturer who's building our current products is telling us that the uh, parts themselves, the data sheets, are incorrect, and you'd have to work directly with the manufacturer. And unless you speak Chinese, it's kind of uh, difficult. That sounds like uh, a recipe to make it very easy to bring a new radio to the market. So we ended up using a part from CMX, a CML rather. Uh, it's called a CMX 7341, which is built by uh, American and uh, uh, UK company. 
and uh, everything is in English, uh, the people speak English, and uh, it's actually possible to do things. Now with this chip, uh, they're building in capabilities of NXDN, DMR, DPMR, and analog. Uh, for the other formats, we'll have to uh, work around that chip because they're not going to provide any support for uh, the other formats at this time. And when you're talking about the other formats, are you talking about things like GMSK? Uh, no, G yeah, exactly. GMSK, uh, D-Star, uh, as well as uh, Fusion and uh, APCO P25 will be done around that chip. Basically the same approach that you know people use with a PC and a sound card. So for our listeners who haven't been following along or may not be aware of the 7000, if you would kind of give the sales pitch of why this radio is really important. Well, the problem with uh, the amateur and commercial market is that if you want to do multi-formats, you have to use multiple amounts of radios. Uh, and depending upon uh, your budget, that could easily be a few thousand dollars uh, if you want to use all the different types of radios. So our approach was to come up with a single radio that does all the formats at a very low price. And it uh, looks like we'll achieve it. And we're hoping, not guaranteed, but we're hoping we'll be able to start selling it uh, at the end of this year. So one of the other things, if I remember correctly, and please correct me if I don't, but originally was there talk of some ability that the firmware source code would be available under an NDA, but you would be able to release it to the community so that folks could modify the radio or, or make additions? Yeah, all of the software uh, is going to be released uh, on, our, on the Internet. You don't have to sign any NDA. But we do have copyright protection, so yes, you can modify our radio, but it doesn't mean you can take our source code and build your own radio for, you know, for commercial purposes. We're not going to stop people from playing around with it for amateur use, but uh, no, we don't want any comp direct competition uh, with what we're doing. So do you guys have any other new products at Dayton this year? Uh, yes, we uh, releasing this year, we're going to actually start shipping in September what's called a CS760, which is the successor to the 750. Uh, advantages of that radio, it has a four, uh, uh, well, color display as well as uh, has GPS, uh, Bluetooth, and a vibrator built in. And that's uh, a mono band available in two meters and 440? Uh, yeah, correct. First, we're going to get the uh, 440, and later we'll do the uh, two meter. Do you have any uh, idea about what street price might be? Uh, yes, we already announced the prices. The uh, price for the basic radio without options is 299. If you get the GPS option, it's 350. And if you want GPS and uh, Bluetooth, it's 399. Now, does somebody have to buy the radio with all the options all at once, or can they be added over time? Uh, they cannot be easily added. Uh, it's almost impossible. In order to add it, you're going to have to basically uh, open the circuitry and solder some parts inside. We're not sure how many at this time. Well, it sounds like you're not opposed to the idea of people installing themselves, but maybe it's highly discouraged. Yeah, unless you uh, have a radio shop and you have the equipment uh, to build and test things, which is usually around $50,000 worth of equipment, uh, you're not going to do it yourself and get it to work. Now, I know it's often hard for vendors at Dayton to get away from their booths, but is there anything that, at, at Dayton that you are interested in seeing yourself as a ham? I'm always interested in seeing what's being done in software-defined radios and what our competitors are doing. Outstanding. Well, Jerry, thank you so much for the time. Today is Saturday morning where things are just starting to get up. I hope you guys have a lot of traffic and a lot more success. If somebody wants to know about your products, where would they go online? Uh, they have two choices. Uh, you can join the CSI, or rather CS7000 Yahoo group, or you can call us and we'll uh, tell you over the phone what the status is. What's the number? It's 818-889-0503. Uh, and what's your website? It's uh, connectsystems.com. All right, Jerry, thank you so much. Have a great day. Uh, thanks for uh, having an interview. This is Steve, KB3SII of QRP Works, and you're listening to Ham Radio 360. I'm with Scott Robbins, Whiskey for Papa Alpha, owner of Viberplex. And Viberplex is a company that's been around for many, many years, with a long history. And it's really interesting to see that Viberplex is still around. And I know, Scott, you have been doing a lot of work to build the business and really be a significant player in the ham radio world. So tell us about Viberplex. Okay, Viberplex is... 
the oldest continuously operating business in amateur radio. We even predate the need for a ham license. Uh, we have been in business continuously since 1905. Uh, we're the largest manufacturer of Morse code keys in the world at present. Um, I took over the Vibroplex company in 2009. I previously was an employee for Ham Radio Outlet in 1994-95. I was the sales manager for Tentech uh, from 1995 to 2009. I went out on my own in 2009 when I purchased Vibroplex. And uh, since that time, we've acquired some other lines besides the Vibroplex line. We bought out our chief competitor, which was Venture Incorporated, uh, in early 2015. We're now also the owner of International Radio, which does crystal filtering. Uh, we also represent uh, Spider Beam, U Kits, and Easy Rotor Control uh, here in the United States as well. So you guys have a really broad product line, and and that's all sold under the Viberplex name. And is the Vi- is Viberplex the uh, website that one would go to? Yeah, the Vi- the website is www.viberplex.com. We have a couple of other web addresses as well, but all of them feed back to the main Viberplex address. Um, you know, code keys are the heart of essentially what we're doing. We are, um, we've got 37 different models of code key right now. We sell uh, our equipment factory direct off of our website. We also, of course, sell through all the major dealers, every uh, major dealer in the United States, AES, Ham Radio Outlet, DX Engineering, and all of the small companies carry us as well. Um, we have dealers on every continent. We've got a couple in Japan, multiple European countries, Australia, a couple of South American countries. Uh, we're worldwide. We're a little bit we're worldwide. <laughs> So a lot of guys that listen to our podcast are interested in learning CW, and they always want to know, well, what kind of key should I get? And when you look at keys, there's different kinds of keys. There's a big price range. Could you give us some advice on what you'd look for as a new ham getting into CW? Yeah, I mean, the thing you'd want to go with, I I, I operate under the the assumption that almost everyone these days has an HF transceiver that's got a built-in keyer. So all you need at that point is a paddle to plug into the radio, and a cable to go between the, uh, the paddle and the radio itself. I always recommend that people start with an iambic paddle. Um, you've got an electronic keyer in the radio. You might as well take advantage of it. Um, you'll be able to send cleaner code, certainly with an electronic keyer, than you're going to be able to do with a straight keyer or a bug. And the people that you're working on the air are going to be appreciative of that as well. And what, what happens sometimes is, um, not that there's anything wrong with using straight keys or bugs, but we find that people have them, then they realize that their code speed is starting to increase. They want to be able to send cleaner code at a higher speed, and you know the ability to do so with a straight key gets outstripped pretty fast. They want to move it onto a paddle, and I say, well, you'd probably be happy with a paddle just right from the get-go. Plug it right into your radio. So tell us, what is the difference between a paddle and a bug? The difference is that um, the paddle essentially is a switch. I mean, you can think of the electronic key in your radio as a switch. You hit one side, you hear da 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 da. You hit the other side, you hear dit 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 dit. And if you were to hold one side down of the iambic paddle plugged into your radio to infinity, it would continue to transmit as long as you wanted to. With the bug, it's actually a mechanical device. You've got a spring uh, that is used to send dits. So when you actuate it with your thumb, it goes dit 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 dit. Eventually, the spring stops springing and it goes dit 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 dee. And you manually form the DAs with the opposite knob. So you would have the spring action to go dit, 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 and then you would send da with your hand. So there's, it's mechanical action, and you have some manual dexterity to use it. Well, with, the, with an iambic panel, you're relying essentially on the electronic key in the radio to make the dits and DAs for you. That's why you can send clean code. It's, the DAs are always correctly spaced. The dits are always spaced. There's no human intervention, let's put it that way, except for just actuating the paddle to send code with. So my very first key was a Viberplex Electro Keyer, which was a, a single paddle that you would move left and right. It wasn't an iambic key, and I used that for some years. And do you still have parts, replacement components, contacts for those older keys? Oh, yeah, very much so. Um, we're able to repair um, uh, anything from 1945 forward. Uh, we had a design change in the bugs uh, back in uh, 1945. So pre-1945 parts we don't have, but anything we built past that, the uh, single lever paddles, iambic paddles, bugs, anything that's on the key we've got as a repair part, um, we can either help you fix it or we can fix it for you. We've got uh, machine drawings of all the keys on the website, parts lists. I mean, it's really as easy as you can order parts by email. I mean, that's where we are in the 21st century. You know, you want parts, you can send me an email, we'll get them out to you. Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, you know, we do it all. So let me switch gears on you a bit. You mentioned that you also have some QRP radios, and a lot of our listeners are interested in portable operating, in, uh, in CW certainly plays into that. So could you tell us a bit about the radios that you have? 
Yeah, um, we represent the UKITS line here in the United States. Uh, UKITS is a uh, company that manufactures products in China. They sell an antenna analyzer, um, QRP, SWR watt meter, QRP antenna tuner, and a transceiver called the HB1B, which is a uh, five watt CW transceiver that operates on the 40, 30, 20, and 15 meter bands. Um, $299, uh, very easy to operate, digital readout, all the things you'd expect a little HF transceiver to have. We sell uh, other stuff for portable operation as well. We sell fiberglass poles uh, from the German manufacturer Spider Beam, uh, portable antennas from them. They have a very lightweight multiband dipole antenna called the 404 UL that weighs 14 ounces, that, uh, 14 ounces including the coax, in fact. They're very easy to put in a little plastic bag, you know, stick it in your pocket, take it with you, thin gauge wire. So it sounds like you have a really great selection of products. Is there anything else that's new coming down the pipe that you'd like to share with us? The only thing that we're doing new at the moment, actually, for Dayton this year, is we're representing a German company called Easy Rotor Control. And ERC uh, manufactures a hardware and software package that allows you to do point-and-click USB control of a typical antenna rotator. Uh, they've got about 90 different models of rotators they support. All the popular uh, Yesu, High Gain, Create, things that we all typically use for ham radio. Um, the circuit board, we have them as kits or assembled items. The circuit board installs inside the rotor control box. You plug it into your shack computer with a USB cable, and you've got a, a, a rotator screen on, the, on your PC that has a 360-degree you know, azimuth indicator, and when you want the beam to point a specific direction, you just move the mouse over, click on it, and the rotator starts turning. And very reasonably priced, we sell those between $89 and $119 and have had a lot of interest in that. Thanks very much, Scott. Really appreciate your time, and have a great Dayton. Thanks very much. I'm here at the Linux in the Ham Shack booth with Russ Woodman, K5TUX, host of the Linux in the Ham Shack podcast. So this is kind of meta, a podcast interviewing another podcast. If you want to call it that, I don't think it's a problem. We uh, have lots of interaction with other podcasts, so um, sure, why not? <laughs> Well, I first became aware of you guys because I had heard that you had given us a shout-out back when we were faux time, and I've been a subscriber ever since. You guys do a really good job. Um, it's cool to see the Linux coming together with amateur radio, really advocating for open source. And honestly, one of the things I enjoy is you cover a wide range of open source topics and Linux topics, and it really keeps me interested and engaged. Well, thank you for, the, for that to start with, and the way I found out about you guys is apparently we shouted you out, and then you guys shouted us out, and I saw the tweet, and I was like, oh, well, this sounds interesting, so we just decided to check it out. But yes, we try and cover as many things as we possibly can in the open source world and in the amateur radio world to try and uh, make it as broad uh, a topic base as we possibly can while maintaining a focus on open source philosophy, um, particularly in the area of amateur radio. But there are so many other topics out there, ham radio-based, scientific-based, things like that. And we also try and cater to both um, the novice user and the advanced user because there's something out there for everybody, and we try and make it as much about everybody as you possibly can. So one of my favorite things about your show that really shows your commitment to open source is that every episode you play Creative Commons music. That's one thing we started doing from the very beginning. Creative Commons music is a great way to let people know about open openness and, and the way openness can be across multiple platforms, not just software, because there's open hardware as well. Uh, Creative Commons is uh, open literature, open music, stuff like that. So, I mean, the philosophy covers all aspects of media and life. Outstanding. So, you guys are at Dayton. Is how how often have you been here? We started coming here in 2010. We have been here every year except for last year. Um, we weren't we weren't able to make it last year. So this is our sixth year that we've been here. Um, we will continue to come here because one thing we've noticed is that while the hobby of amateur radio is an open hobby, you know you can find published schematics on how to build things and stuff like that, which is very much an open philosophy. At the time that the software was created for the ham radio hobby, it tended to be in the DOS and the Microsoft Windows days before Linux really took off. And so everyone started developing for Windows. So 
as time has gone on, you find that while the hobby is open, most of the software is not. And it's changing. It's a thing that's it's happening. It's, it's kind of a slow thing. And we're just trying to augment that change. Well, and to your point, I own more or less one Windows PC because most of my amateur radio software that I use is Windows. Yes, one thing we've been trying to do is get people to understand that they don't have to use Ham Radio Deluxe to actually do their Ham Radio digital modes and stuff like that. And we've we've there have been many people who come here today and we're like, well, we would like to try out your Linux software and and you know, get a feel for what it's like and then they'll say, well, I'm running Ham Radio Deluxe and we'll have to say, oh, well, Ham Radio Deluxe doesn't run under Windows and then there's there's a there's a slight sense of um Negativity, maybe, <laughs> about that. Um, it used to be that the early versions of Ham Radio Deluxe actually ran under Windows, under Wine, or under Linux, under Wine, uh, but that's no longer the case. So, getting people to change their mindset about that is is hard to do. But we find that people are more open to it now than ever before, and it seems like every year we come here, it, they're even more open to it and more willing to try at least. And with the idea of live distros, so that people can. You know, try it on their systems without having to override anything. Uh, makes it a wonderful way to to try and get into the hobby. And since it's inexpensive, i.e., free, you know, uh, they could try it, no cost to them, no risk whatsoever. And it's a wonderful way to get them to at least see if it's something they'd be willing to to progress with. And uh, I think I think for the most part, um, once they get a taste of it. Um, they enjoy it more than they think they would. All right, so let's try a little bit of a flash quiz, because to your point about folks who are coming from Windows, they know that's where the software is. So I'll kind of take Ham Radio Deluxe out of the mix because they try to be all things to all people all the time. But let's cover some common use cases. Let's start with logging. What logging? What's the best logging program or your favorite logging application on Linux? Okay, well, we try to avoid using the term best when it comes to an application because there is a wide variety of stuff out there. So what we like to comment on are the most popular ones. And I would say for a logging application, CQR log is probably far and away the most popular logging application. That's not a contest logger, uh, but for your general logging application, CQR log is probably the most popular. Um, It integrates with the ham library, so it gets your radio information directly into the logging application. It interfaces with Logbook of the World and EQSL and all that kind of stuff. Um, So it's probably the most popular. Will I say it's the best? No, I can't say that because I'm not willing to say that. But yes, we'll call it the most popular. All right, you mentioned Hamlib, and that's how we get rig control in Linux, correct? That is how we get rig control. It's basically a database of interfaces between a computer and a ham radio. Uh, it's a list of uh, methods for interacting because most radios interface with a serial port, which is basically just a straight ASCII text um, sending commands back and forth between the radio. And so it's actually very easy to control a radio. And all you have to do is have a library that says what commands need to be sent from the computer to the radio to actually do things like change the frequency, set the upper and lower sideband, and all that kind of thing. So the ham library is a database of all uh, many radios, not every radio out there, but certainly a great many of them um, that allow you to control your rig with your computer. All right, what about, spe- that's controlling radios, what about programming radios? Well, programming radios, as far as like memories and things like that, um, the application that we hear most about is Chirp. Um, and that's, generally speaking, for like mobiles and handy talkies and stuff like that. Um, as far as programming like an HF rig, I'm not aware of anything that will do that. I'm not sure if Chirp will or not. But it, when it comes to things like your Baofeng radios and uh, all your Chinese radios that are a nightmare to program uh, through the you know, through the touchpad or something like that, uh, the Python-based Chirp is the one that everyone uses. All right, and then finally, what about APRS? APRS, well, the most popular, again, that, that we're aware of is Zaster, uh, which is X-A-S-T-I-R. That's the one that most people use for APRS. It, it does pretty much everything APRS. It'll send messages, it'll do location and everything like that. The biggest problem I hear about Zaster is getting map data. Um, 
It uses OpenStreetMap, so it's all open source, but integrating op the OpenStreetMap map data with Zaster is, generally speaking, a big problem for most people. And since I'm not an APRS user, I have not been able to answer those people's question, but maybe someday I'll figure it out. Well, I'm disappointed you missed the pun opportunity with it's a disaster. Okay, well, it kind of is, yes, and I'm sorry I missed that. <laughs> All right. Well, Russ, I really appreciate your time. We are planning episodes, crossover episodes. We're going to have you on Ham Radio 360 to kind of do a general overview and introduction to Linux for our listeners. And then George and I will be doing episodes with you to deep dive sometime in the future to be scheduled. Um, thank you so much for your time. Anything you want to leave our listeners with? Uh, no, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you guys. And I am looking forward to the crossover episodes and I'm looking forward to letting the Ham Radio 360 listener base know about open source. And I know uh, Kale keeps bringing it up that he's going to get into Linux and all that kind of thing. And we hope, if nothing else, that our interaction with you guys will, will get him on that road, get, get you all started. <laughs> so there's several of us in the, in the family of Ham Radio 360 that look forward to this because literally he calls a friend of ours, Gerald, from the side of the road, help me with my Raspberry Pi. <laughs> I actually didn't hear it. Oh. Well, thank you very much, and 73. All right, well, thank you, 73. Hallo, liebe SWLs, YLs und OM. Sie hören den Deutschlandrundspruch Nummer 24 des Deutschen Amateur Radio Clubs für die 24. Kalenderwoche 2016. Diesmal haben wir Meldungen zu folgenden Themen. Die 41. Ham Radio und Maker Fair Bodensee in Friedrichshafen. Empfehlungen für CEPT und Novis Lizenzen revidiert. Alpha Charlie 2 Sierra November erhält Ehrung aus dem Weißen Haus. Überregionales Peilsporttraining für Gelegenheitsfuchsjäger und Newcomer. Aktuelle Conteste und was gibt es Neues vom Funkwetter. Zum ersten Thema im Deutschlandrundspruch. 41. Hem Radio und Maker Fair Bodensee in Friedrichshafen. Vom 24. bis 26. Juni findet die 41. Hem Radio mitsamt der Parallelveranstaltung Maker Fair Bodensee am 25. und 26. Juni auf dem Messegelände Friedrichshafen statt. Schon kurz nach Eröffnung werden die Massen in die Hallen A3 und A4 auf den großen Flohmarkt strömen, um sich danach die große Ausstellung mit den ideellen und kommerziellen Ausstellern in der Halle A1 näher anzusehen. Weiterhin werden das umfänglich gestaltete Programm des 67. Bodenseetreffens sowie die DARC-Bühne im Messefoyer Publikumsmagnete sein. Zahlreiche Referenten geben den Messebesuchern hier Informationen aus erster Hand. In diesem Jahr lädt der DARC-Vorstand zur Veranstaltung Vorstand, Amateurräte und Mitglieder im Dialog ein. Diese findet am Messe Samstag, dem 25. Juni, in der Halle A2, Raum 2, von 16 bis ca. 17.30 Uhr statt. Haben Sie Fragen, die Sie an den Vorstand oder an Amateurräte stellen möchten? Diese Veranstaltung bietet dazu eine gute Gelegenheit. Passend zum diesjährigen Messemotto Amateurfunk zu Lande, zu Wasser und in der Luft hat der DARC e.V. zwei Zeppeline gebucht, in denen ein Operator mitfliegt, um das Rufzeichen Delta Lima 0 Zulu Zulu Foxtrot Strich AM DL 0 ZZF AM in die Luft zu bringen. Am Freitag, den 24. Juni um 16 Uhr und am Samstag, den 25. Juni um 17.05 Uhr wird Hans Schwarz, Delta Kilo 5 Juliet India, bei guter Wetterlage FM-Betrieb auf 145,550 Megahertz aus dem Zeppelin machen. Wie in den Jahren zuvor lädt der Arbeitskreis Amateurfunk und Telekommunikation in der Schule, AATIS, zu seiner Lehrerfortbildung ein. Ein universitäres Programm finden die Besucher mit der SDR Academy, der Notfunk Universität und der Contest University vor. Die Jugend wird sich am Bastelstand nahe des DARC Zentrums in Halle A1 nebst der Ham Rally wiederfinden. Grund zum Feiern gibt es am Samstagabend, den 25. Juni ab 18 Uhr zur Ham Night auf dem Messegelände. Die Partyband Pop Deluxe wird mit ihrer musikalischen Bandbreite von Pop, Soul, Funk über Latin und Jazz für Stimmung sorgen und eine Feuerakrobatin heizt den Gästen im weiteren Verlauf des Abends mächtig ein. Parallel zur Ham Radio findet in der Messehalle A5 die Maker Fair Bodensee statt. Hier geht es ums Basteln und Tüfteln. Die verschiedenen Programme zum Bodenseetreffen, Aktionsbühne und Lehrerfortbildung und anderes finden Sie auf der DARC Webseite unter dem Menüpunkt Nachrichten. Der DARC e.V. hofft auf viele Besucher. Wir sehen uns am Bodensee. 
Empfehlungen für CEPT und Novice-Lizenzen revidiert. Ende Mai hat man bei einem Treffen der CEPT-Arbeitsgruppe Frequenzmanagement, WGFM, Änderungen der CEPT-Empfehlungen TR 6101. Diese betreffen die CEPT-Lizenz und ECC 0506, der Novice-Lizenz, gut geheißen. Die Regeln für den Beitritt außereuropäischer Staaten zu beiden Empfehlungen hat man auf Vorschlag der IARU Region 1 vereinfacht. Die geänderten Dokumente, die aktuell keine unmittelbare Auswirkung haben, sind im Internet abrufbar. Darüber berichtet Peter A. Joost, Hotel Bravo 9 Charlie Echo Tango auf der Webseite des Schweizer Amateurfunkverbandes USKA. Alpha Charlie 2 Sierra November erhält Ehrung aus dem Weißen Haus. Das Weiße Haus in den USA hat kürzlich Limor Freed, Alpha Charlie 2 Sierra November, als White House Champion of Change ausgezeichnet. Als sie Ingenieurswissenschaften am Massachusetts Institut der Technologie, kurz MIT, studierte, fasste sie den Entschluss, eine Firma zu gründen, die sich der Unterstützung zum Erlernen der Elektronik für die Maker-Generation aller Altersklassen widmet. So entstand im Jahr 2005 die Firma Adafruit, die mittlerweile über 100 Angestellte in New York City beschäftigt. Hinter Alpha Charlie 2 Sierra November verbirgt sich aber noch mehr. Sie gehört zum Kernteam, welches sich mit dem Firmware-Hack des preiswerten DMR-Funkgerätes MD380 bzw. RT3 de facto baugleich beschäftigt. Darauf weist Alexander Eickhoff, Delta Fox.8 Alpha Victor hin. Die alternative Firmware ist über das Internet zu beziehen. Die Installation erfolgt natürlich auf eigene Gefahr. Überregionales Peilsporttraining für Gelegenheitsfuchsjäger und Newcomer. Am zweiten Wochenende im Juli veranstalten die Hildesheimer Funkamateure südlich von Hannover eine Serie von Peilwettbewerben auf 80 Meter und 2 Meter, kombiniert mit Trainingselementen aus dem Orientierungslauf. Je nach Vorkenntnissen profitieren die Teilnehmer von der Einführung für Newcomer bis hin zu Trainingsrunden mit früheren WM-Teilnehmern. Parallel zum Training findet eine weitere Veranstaltung statt. In zwei Ranglistenläufen wetteifern die ARDF-Leistungssportler um den DL-Pokal. Zwischen den Läufen und beim abendlichen Grillfest der Trainings- und Wettkampfteilnehmer bietet sich manche Gelegenheit, Tipps von erfahrenen Peilmeistern zu erhalten. Weitere Infos und Anmeldungen zum niedersächsischen Peilsportwochenende finden Sie auf der Internetseite des Ortsverbandes Hildesheim, Hotel 15. Peilempfänger können vor Ort ausgeliehen werden. Anmeldeschluss ist der 27. Juni. Darüber berichtet Gerhard Kotschlag, Delta Lima 9, Delta Bravo Kilo. Aktuelle Conteste am 18. Juni, da starten sowohl der Vierrack VHF Contest, der Eisenbahner, das ist ein SSB Contest auf zwei Meter, sowie der AGCW DL VHF UHF Contest. Telegrafie auf 2 Meter und 70 Zentimeter an diesem Samstag. Das gesamte Wochenende hindurch, 18. und 19. Juni, da kommt aus Japan der JARL All Asian DX Contest sowie aus der Ukraine der Ukrainian DX Classic RTTY Contest zu uns. Am 25. und 26. Juni, also am nächsten Wochenende, da läuft der Ukrainian DX Digi Contest. Die Ausschreibungen finden Sie auf der Webseite des DX und HF Funksportreferates sowie mittels der Contest Termintabelle in der CQDL in der Juni Ausgabe auf Seite 58. Der Funkwetterbericht vom 14. Juni, herausgegeben von Hartmut Büttig, DL1VDL. Zunächst der Rückblick vom 7. bis 13. Juni. In einer Woche steht die Sonne im Zenit über dem Äquator und das halbe Jahr im Funkwettergeschehen ist Vergangenheit. Man sieht es auch an den greyline zeiten die sich im Vergleich zur Vorwoche so gut wie nicht geändert haben. In zwei Wochen ist der Terminator rückläufig. Highlights im Funkwetter waren die Öffnungen im 6-Meter-Band. Am Nachmittag des 13. Juni konnte man auf 6 Meter mit einfachen Antennen von Europa mit Nordamerika funken. Darauf haben wir lange gewartet. Die Sonnentätigkeit war, verglichen mit der Vorwoche, etwas besser. Es gab 5 C-Flares und der solare Flux stieg von 79 auf 91 Einheiten. Das geomagnetische Feld war überwiegend ruhig, der K-Index lag zwischen 0 und 3. Auf Kurzwelle bot erwartungsgemäß das 20-Meter-Band die besten DX-Möglichkeiten. 
Vorhersage bis zum 21. Juni. Von zwei sichtbaren Sonnenflecken bleibt uns die Region 2553 als C-Flair-Quelle erhalten. Die Fluxwerte bleiben unter 90 Einheiten. Geomagnetische Störungen sind zwischen dem 15. und 17. Juni wahrscheinlich. Das stabilste DX-Band bleibt 20 Meter. 17 und 15 Meter öffnen nicht täglich und die Bänder darüber zeigen Short Skip Ausbreitungen und Öffnungen nach Süden. Junitypisch bleibt das tägliche Erscheinen der sporadischen E-Schicht. Es lohnt sich unbedingt, bereits morgens das 6 Meter Band nach eventuellen Öffnungen Richtung Fernost und nachmittags nach Westen hin zu beobachten. Und hier nur noch die Orientierungszeiten für Greyline DX, alle Zeiten in UTC, Sonnenaufgang in Neuseeland ist um 19.31 Uhr, in Ostaustralien um 21.33 Uhr, in Westaustralien um 23.14 Uhr, in Singapur geht die Sonne auf um 22.59 Uhr Weltzeit, in Japan um 19.24 Uhr, in Honolulu auf Hawaii, dort geht die Sonne auf um 15.48 Uhr UTC, in Anchorage in Alaska um 12.18 Uhr, in Johannesburg in Südafrika geht die Sonne auf um 4.52 Uhr, an der USA-Westküste in Kalifornien um 12.46 Uhr, auf den Falklandinseln um 12.03 Uhr und in Berlin in Deutschland geht die Sonne um 2.42 Uhr Weltzeit auf. Sonnenuntergang USA-Ostküste 0.28 Uhr, USA-Westküste 3.33 Uhr, in Sao Paulo in Brasilien, dort geht die Sonne auf um 20.27 Uhr UTC, auf den Falklandinseln um 19.51 Uhr, auf Hawaii um 5.14 Uhr, in Anchorage in Alaska, dort geht die Sonne unter um 7.36 Uhr UTC, in Johannesburg in Südafrika um 15.23 Uhr, in Neuseeland um 5.10 Uhr und in Berlin in Deutschland verschwindet die Sonne um 19.31 Uhr UTC hinter dem Horizont. Das war der DRC Deutschland Rundspruch für diese Woche. Die Redaktion hatte Stefan Hüpper, DH5 FFL vom Amateurfunkmagazin CQDL. Am Mikrofon war Michael Eggers, Delta Lima 9, Lima Bravo Golf. Diesen Rundspruch gibt's auch als PDF und MP3 Datei auf der DRC Webseite sowie in Packet Radio unter der Rubrik DRC. Wenn Sie Meldungen für den Deutschland Rundspruch haben, also mit bundesweiter Relevanz, schicken Sie Ihre Beiträge gerne per Post oder Fax an die Redaktion CQDL sowie per Per E-Mail bitte ausschließlich an die E-Mail-Adresse redaktion.drc.de. Vielen Dank fürs Zuhören und AWDH. Bis zur nächsten Woche. PA00 News füllende Udsendelse inneholder nogle schockerende Exempler på, hvordan en hobby kan ændre liv i unge under 18. Kraftigt til stede værelsen af en voksen anbefales. Ik wil heel graag nog even wijzen op de repeater PI3 UTR, die tenslotte deze uitzending in grote mate mogelijk maakt. Je kunt de repeater sponsoren op de website van PI3 UTR. Uh, zo'n repeater, daar wordt altijd aan geknutseld, dus eigenlijk zijn altijd alle middelen welkom en bedenk hoeveel inzet het kost om, uh, en gekost heeft om de repeater op deze plek te krijgen en dit fantastische bereik te realiseren. Dus allemaal naar pi3utr.nl 7, 